Welcome everybody and thank you for joining us. I'm Professor Adam Schooler, Assistant Professor of Journalism and Media Production here at U of M Dearborn. Um, we're excited to be here today for this special presentation from the classroom to the big and small screen. Um, but before we begin uh, and welcome our panelists who will speak with us on their experiences working in the film and television industry, I want to share a little bit about the journalism and media production major and the student organization Wolverine Media Network here at U of M Dearborn. The recently rebranded journalism and media production program, formerly known as journalism and screen studies, offers students studies in news and reporting, print and photojournalism, documentary, new media, and narrative and short filmmaking. Classes which are taught by industry experts from Pul Pulitzer Prize winners to Telly Award recipients to filmmakers with festival accolades, there are on campus experiential learning opportunities through the Michigan Journal, student newspaper, UMD College Radio, and the media production studio, which we're sitting in today, which is fully equipped, flexible production space for producing television news, green screen compositing, narrative film shoots, and new media applications. <coughs> I would like to turn it over briefly to Sydney McKinney Williams uh, to give a, us a quick overview on the Wolverine um, Media Network. Um, Sydney's a student in our program, so Sydney, if you'd like to come up and say a couple words about that. All right, hello everybody. Um, my name is Sydney as Mr. Mr. Adam just said. Uh, I am part of the Wolverine Media Network. We encompass four different media-based organizations. We have the news station, which also encompasses the journalism side, which is the Michigan Journal. We have the radio station, who also they work on podcasts and more audio-driven work. We have the campus video network, which I am the president of. We do a lot of videography, photography, and services along that. And we also have Lyceum, which is our fine arts journal. They specialize in a lot of short story writing. They specialize in poetry, even screenwriting, things like that. Um, we all work together. We all collaborate with each other. As somebody who's done the video production side, I've worked with the radio, Lyceum, and the Michigan Journal many times. A lot of our members have done cross, you know, cross work throughout the different organizations. And it's honestly just something that we all use to form a creative community, to be able to lean on each other, to be able to have people who are more versed in a certain topic and less versed in another one but we are able to help each other and push out great content and push out great collaborations as well. So it's a very nice on-campus community that allows students and even staff members and other faculty members to come through and get more insight about these services and about these types of things. Well, thank you so much, Sydney. Um, we are excited to welcome students from JUMP and uh, the Wolverine Media Network here today in our audience. Um, before I have the privilege of introducing our panelists, some quick housekeeping remarks. This event is being recorded and will later be featured in the U of M Dearborn Alumni Engagement Speaker Series. We encourage you to visit umdearborn.edu slash alumni to check out more previous speakers that have been highlighted in the past. Um, later in the program, we will have the opportunity to ask our panelists questions from the audience. Please hold your questions for this time. Now, without further ado, I'm honored to welcome our exter expert panel of U of M Dearborn alumni and our friends. <coughs> Mark Levine is a writer, director, and producer of television and film. Mark has worked for three decades with his wife and partner, Jennifer Flackett. They are co-creators and executive producers of Netflix animated series Big Mouth and Human Resources. Um, their screenplay credits include Madeline, Journey to the Center of the Earth, Wimbledon, and The Atom Project. They wrote and directed the films Little Manhattan and Nims Island, which starred Jodie Foster. Uh, Mark received this, his undergraduate degree from the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. His father, Dr. Donald Levine, was a proud member of the U of M Dearborn faculty, and during his career at U of M Dearborn, he had spent an unprecedented unprecedented 18 years as chair of the Department of Behavioral Science in the College of Arts, Science, and Lectures. Please welcome Mark. Hi, thank you. Pleasure to be here. <coughs> um, Laura Oberstadt, um, Abel is an entertainment marketing executive with two decades 
of film studio experience and currently works at the Walt Disney Company. Um, during her time at the marketing, uh, as a marketing strategy lead at both New Line Cinema and 20th Century Fox, she oversaw the home entertainment campaigns for a diverse slate of films and franchises, including the Lord of the Rings trilogy, Austin Powers, A Nightmare on Elm Street, The Notebook, Hairspray, The Sound of Music, Avatar, Titanic, 007 James Bond, and Star Wars. She moved into theatrical marketing and oversaw the international campaigns for the films The Fault in, in Our Stars, The Maze Runner Trilogy, The Revenant, Night, and Night at the Museum, Secret of the Tomb, and many more. In addition, she produced industry events at Comic-Con in San Diego and um, Sao Paulo, Brazil, as well as Cine Europe in Barcelona, Spain, Laura is a U of M Dearborn alumni and currently lives in Los Angeles, California with her husband, Joe, and their adorable terrier mix, Sydney. Please give Laura a welcome. <coughs> Damien Resnick is a 25-year veteran of the film and television industry. He began his career primarily in the location department, including as a New York-based location manager for 16 years on productions including Cloverfield, Morning Glory, Super, The Super 8, um, Leftovers, Mr. Robot, and since 2015 he has worked as a unit production manager and producer in scripted television and feature films. His credits include Marvel's Luke Cage, Hightown Harlem, and Rami, as well as the recently released Apple feature film Sharper and the upcoming uh, untitled John Watts Project. Damien is a native New Yorker and lives in Manhattan with his wife, Dr. Meredith Resnick, a U of M Dearborn alumni. Um, they have three children and two dogs. And please give Damien a warm welcome. A uh, native of Michigan, Tom Waring was drawn to U of M Dearborn by their co-op program and graduated in 1975 with a BBA degree in accounting. He has had an eclectic career in public accounting, the automotive industry, international currency, and entertainment. His systems, finan financial, and operational skills gleaned from his years at the American Motors Corporation and at Volkswagen of America led him to a position at Lyric Corporation, which is the parent company of Barney and Friends, and Wishbone both of which aired on PBS, which he, which he eventually became the CFO. Sandwiched between two stints at Lyric, Tom worked at Currency Systems International, CSI, um, first as a controller and then as president. CSI designed, built, and installed, serviced, and uh, did all that for high-speed bank hole counting and sort sorting equipment used at, um, by central and commercial banks around the world. In the spring of 2001, Tom and his family relocated to Raleigh, North Carolina and co-founded Trailblazer Studios, where he has served as the CEO and CFO since December 2001. Please join me in welcoming Mark, Laura, Damien, and Tom. So I have some questions that um, are for all of you. Uh, first, I'm wondering if you can please share a little bit about uh, your background and how you got where you are today in um, this industry. Maybe we'll start with Mark. Um, well, I um, have always been interested in writing uh, ever since I was a kid. And uh, when I was uh, a at university and I was at uh, the Ann Arbor campus, um, around 19 years old, I decided I really wanted to put myself to uh, dramatic writing. So uh, I started writing for the theater and I applied to the Yale School of Drama um, as a playwright um, when I was, um, where, when I graduated from Michigan, I got into the Yale School of Drama and I went there for a couple of years and a producer in LA read some of my work. His name was David Milch and he's a successful television producer who created NYPD Blue and Deadwood and a lot of really acclaimed shows and he had read some of my work when I was uh, a student at Yale and invited me to come out and become an apprentice writer on um, 
the, his show that he was doing at that time. It was 1989. He was doing a show about the um, about a group of people who worked at a newspaper. But so I went out and um, spent the summer kind of as an apprentice writer. And then he asked me to stay on, and I and I did, and that kind of my career began there. Uh, after that, I got lucky enough to work on a show called The Wonder Years as a writer uh, and did that for several years uh, until the conclusion of that series. And then I went on and, and worked on a couple of the shows, but started creating things. Um, uh, started create, I created my first show in uh, 1994, um, which was an adventure, a science fiction adventure show that Steven Spielberg executive produced. and, and uh, that um, was a short-lived project. We did it for one season, but um, it kind of introduced me to what uh, it was like to create a show, and 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 I had a, you know, a great learning experience, if not a great creative experience. Um, and then um, after that, uh, my wife and I st started writing together, and we decided we wanted to devote ourselves to film. We wrote our first screenplay, in, um, and uh, then from the late 90s till around 10 years ago, around 2012, uh, we devoted ourselves only to feature film, really. And we wrote several feature films and we had the opportunity to direct two of those films, um, which were described earlier. Um, uh, so I'm very, so I've had a lot of experience in both television and film through that. And then uh, in 2012 and 13, we took um, uh, a year off to, inspired by my father's uh, sabbatical year, he would every seventh year of his career would take a year off, as professors often do, to take uh, time off to kind of recharge and collect their thoughts. And we were both inspired by that and decided to do a kind of sabbatical year ourselves in 2012 and 13. We called it a year to think. <laughs> uh, and we took off with our children who were in fourth and eighth grade at the time. We took off a year and we rented our house and stopped our careers and, and traveled uh, around the world. Of, I went to 38 countries and lived out of a single suitcase, each of us, and, and did that and clear our, 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 our head, heads and give us some time to, to rest and uh, come up with new ideas. And one of those new ideas was the show Big Mouth that... Uh, um, we started in 2015 and it came out in, on Netflix in 2017. And now, anyway, that's a little bit of how I got started and, and, and my journey over the last 30 plus years. Congratulations. That's amazing. Um, maybe, Laura, you want to share a little bit about um, how you got started as well? Sure. Um, I had always sort of leaned towards uh, being in marketing of some sort, I knew I wanted to work on a project or a product that was really interesting to me. I wasn't quite sure how to get there. Um, as it turns out, I did join WUMD when I was at in college and I got to a um, program director spot. And I used to deal with all of the um, the labels and their you know marketing teams and I kind of knew that's what I wanted to do. And so I finished school and I moved to the East Coast immediately. I had an opportunity to work for one of the companies I dealt with at UMD and um, kind of realized within a year that I was um, in the right mall, but the wrong store. Like the music business wasn't going to be um, a good fit for me for the long term. And all the jobs that I wanted were in L.A. So um, I knew that maybe movies or TV was where I was more interested in. So. I won't bore you with the whole journey, but eventually I got myself out to LA. I um, didn't have any connections. So I went to a placement agency and I uh, got placed at the Jim Henson company, which was really exciting for me. I mean, I was, you know, I grew up, um, I was born in the seventies and grew up in the eighties. So the Muppets are a really big deal and meeting um, the Henson family and, and doing that job, but it was in HR. So I did that job for about a year um, and my boss, being in HR, gets, um, this shows you how old it is, faxes all the time of people who are looking for jobs to fill, connections that she has all over the industry. And this job, this marketing job came through at a studio called New Line Cinema, and I was perfect for it. So I, I mustered up the courage to ask her if she'd recommend me for it. And she did, and, and that changed everything. I got into marketing. It was in home entertainment marketing. So I'm like, I'll be here for two years and I'll go into theatrical marketing because that's the dream, right? And so um, <laughs> I spent 10 years in home entertainment. Mm -hmm. um, but it was the 
single best 10 years of experience I've ever had in my life. It was, it still ranks as my top job. I working at a small studio is I work at the biggest studio now. So working at a small studio affords you a lot of opportunity to grow in a lot of different ways and get a lot of different experience. I was extremely well-rounded marketing person um, when I left New Line. So I wouldn't have never left New Line if I'm being honest, but um, New Line merged into Warner Brothers. And so I was, um, me and my whole department were released back out into the wild. Um, I got a job at 20th Century Fox um, in home entertainment again, of course, um, but I, I had dreamed to move over to theatrical and they had a really great theatrical program. I also learned international marketing at this point. So um, it's a really big part of the industry. So it was really great to kind of get in there and learn that really well. Um, I got the job from theatrical. So I did that for several years. Um, all the time during my career, I always was doing events. It always just kept finding me, I always say. Um, and so I, the, the fact that I had events is what got me the job in theatrical. I did theatrical strategy for quite a while, but I was also doing events on the side. And when the merger with Disney came up, um, they sort of uh, used my experience on events. They had a gap in their staff where they could really use somebody who had that event experience. And so I specialized into events now that I'm at Disney. So. Um, that's been my journey. My journey has been the product of mergers and takeovers, um, but they have led to things that, um, jobs that maybe I may not have ever gotten or not have looked at, or I may not have left the comfort of the job I was in. So, um, that's where I am today. Um, so what I do generally is, uh, there's a lot of meetings. Everybody knows how big of a company Disney is, but they make tons of consumer products. They release a lot of movies. Um, they have parks. I don't really get involved in the park side of anything, but all of these movies and series, um, we really seek to have partners on board. So people who own cinemas and people who make toys and so on and so forth. And so we have to show a lot of very confidential information for that to happen. And so my team manages a bank of pitch material so that, you know, people can go out and pitch Hasbro and, and Funko and all of these great things that you see or cinema owners to get really great support in cinema. So I have a block of content and I, I, I'm the gatekeeper for them getting it to pitch it to their meeting. But um, I manage content over all of our brands. So here we have Disney live action, um, animation, Pixar, Marvel, 20th Century Studios, Lucasfilm and Searchlight. So all of that product uh, on the studio side comes through my group to be used for pitch materials. So that's what I do. That's such an interesting um, journey. And you've been through so many different parts of the um, marketing field, I guess, to get to a, where you are now. Yeah. So. Yeah. And I think um, just to, to button it up, I know, you know, there's a, we're a well-represented group. Um, I guess I represent the part of the business that doesn't make the movies. I have nothing to do right. with writing, making, producing, on set, nothing. I am literally the part of the business that is the the machine that gets it out into the world. So marketing uh, covers many different um, disciplines. I just stand in, uh, right now I'm off on the side doing events thing, but strategy sort of stands in the middle and you have publicity people. And but there's a whole world of post-production and and editors and like so much stuff that, that happens. And finance people, if you're like, oh, I'm kind of interested in, in counting the money. Well, there's a whole team of people that do that. You know, there's a lot of different roles within entertainment that have nothing to do with making the movie. So um, hopefully those in the room can think about like where they feel like they fit in if they don't feel like they're a writer or a director or whatever, that there's a lot of, a lot of space in this industry that takes a lot of people to bring something to market, so. Well, maybe I'll take um, your cue there and uh, jump over to Tom, who comes out of that um, financial world and uh, learn from him about, you know, how he got his start. Well, I started out in Ann Arbor, um, freshman, sophomore years, and um, this is a, a 1971 to 73. My wife hates me for, for me to say this, but when I was born, there were only 48 states. So it was back <laughs> in the day, and uh, there weren't a lot of jobs in the early 70s. And uh, what attracted me, you were in Dearborn, they had a mandatory co-op program 
for their BBA degree. So um, if you had a, a good internship, you're pretty much assured of a full-time job upon graduation. So, uh, and it was really helpful. It was a decent paying job uh, during my internships at American Motors and I graduated with an accounting degree. Um, I wasn't smart enough to, to get hired into a CPA firm, but I eventually got a job and got certified. And after three years realized I did not like that, uh, working with taxes and that sort of thing. So. I went back into the auto industry for about 11 years uh, with Volkswagen and uh, took a wagon train down to Texas where I worked until 1989 with a Volkswagen. We were acquired by a French company, which was interesting to go from a German cultured company to a French cultured company. And uh, there were some odd things being done with the books in 1991. So I said, I have to leave <laughs> and uh, left without a job and stumbled into the entertainment world um, where I was helping implement a cost module for a computer system for the parent of what was then Barney and Wishbone, uh, going to become Barney and Wishbone. And I started dating someone there and I didn't think that was wise. So I went into the currency world with some people that I knew and uh, helped them a bit and then uh, married that person. And so I went back to the entertainment industry and became the CFO at uh, Lyric Corporation. And um, my brother-in-law is uh, Rick Duffield, who created and was the executive producer of Wishbone. Uh, he and his wife, my his wife and my wife were sisters, and we co-own uh, Lyric, excuse me, Trailblazer Studios. Um, and so both companies I was with in 2001 were sold. Uh, Lyric was sold and Currency Systems International was sold. And so we decided to uh, move. Uh, Texas was hot, flat, no trees. So um, found this play book called Places Rated Almanac and ranked 300 cities in the US by 10 different criteria. And what was important to us was kids' education, quality of life, and healthcare. So we sell it, settled in the Raleigh-Durham area and found a couple businesses available and purchased them. Uh, uh, production company and small animation company and uh, put that together and been doing that ever since. And so I, like Laura, you know, I'm, I'm not on the camera, behind the camera writing or anything like that. I'm more managing a group of talented artists and more on the post-production side uh, of things. Um, so we do a lot of post-production. We probably specialize being in Raleigh in remote production before it became unnecessary with COVID. Um, and that's a small world, Mark. Um, uh, my brother-in-law went to Yale Divinity for his master's and his friend Scott Myers, who is a writer, he wrote K9. And he, um, he has a great for you aspiring writers, Into the Story. It's a, it's a website called Into the Story. And it has a lot of great things about scripts. If people are interested in that and analyzing scripts, uh, he's also published a book. So funny how it is a small world. Yeah, very. Yeah. Thanks, Tom. Um, and Damien, uh, you, it seems like you're in a whole nother part of um, the business and I, I'm curious to hear how you, you found yourself there. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I'm much more in the, the freelance on the ground, uh, making the helping to make the movie world. Uh, I was lucky enough to have a connection in the business and uh, my summer job as a high school student was working as a PA or an intern in a production office. And that was my entree to the business. Um, I, uh, I went to college, Half, halfway through college, I figured out I could study film and I transferred schools and studied in undergrad. And right after I graduated, I used my you know connections to who I met in the couple of summers working and, and working over the summers in, in college. And I knew some people and actually had a couple of things on my resume graduating college, which was a real advantage and kept in touch with them, networked and then uh, right after I graduated, I basically went to work and haven't stopped working since. And uh, in the freelance world, it's really all about that. It's about working hard, taking any opportunity that comes your way and working your way up and uh, learning uh, as you're earning at the same time. And that was my route and still is very much so. The route's not not over. Uh, it's still the route. Yeah, I mean, for um, both for you, Laura and Mark, you were you talked a little bit about uh, just kind of the entrance point, um, mm. which sounds like it's hustling <laughs> a little bit, you know, um, 
Mark submitting his work. Uh, it sounds like almost blind. Is that the case, Mark, that you just kind of like found people out in the world who... I, I did. I mean, I had the good fortune of, and this happens, um, of getting connections through my university, actually, both when I was at University of Michigan. Um, there was a professor who had a relationship with um, a, a different producer who gave me the opportunity to come out in a, in a summer during college and be a, a, an intern and that kind of created gave me a demystified the world a little bit and gave me the sense that it was possible to work out there and and um and then through when i was at yale I, as i say there there was a um uh i think my work was initially shared through a faculty member who thought that um it would be you know wor worth him meeting see, learning about my work but hustling is a key thing i i remember when i was 19 years old i went to u of m cocktail party i was out we're doing a like a you know a, an internship for the summer in la and i went to a cocktail party and i got to meet at that cocktail party another u of m alumni named lawrence kasdan who is like the biggest uh, screenwriter, uh, one of the biggest screenwriters of the last several decades, and wrote two of the first three Star Wars movies, and I think um, did the Big Chill famously, but also um, might have been involved in some of the Indiana Jones stuff. And um, he, he was about the biggest writer there was, and I was an aspiring writer. And I went up to him at this cocktail party, and I said, "Hey, uh, Mr. Kasdan, do you have any uh, advice that you could give to a, an aspiring young writer?" um for a way to break in you know and he he was kind of quiet guy and he just looked at his shoes and only said one word and he said right <laughs> and i was like oh okay i was hoping he was gonna say come with me i'm gonna make your dreams come true uh go you know let's go on this journey together and he just said right um and it, you know of course even though at the time i didn't know the importance of that advice but for me and my, my journey was it was essential because I just had a dream. I didn't have the material at the time, you know. Um, so I had to go and each day still have to go put my head down and stare at the blank page and come up with stories and ideas. And that's, you know, the hustle in a way. You're hustling, you win once you've written, but you've got to, you got to write first and creating. And now the word actually, yeah, isn't just write, it's create because you have so many opportunities to create things um, and put it up on YouTube or put it out there through Twitter or just use uh, even more freely available tools uh, like the camera on your phone than were available to us when I, you know, 1987 when I was kind of just your age. So um, yeah, that's. Uh, hustle and, uh, and and constantly be creating. Yeah, and um, Laura, it sounds like you kind of found like a headhunting group who you worked with. What what was that like? Yeah, it was a I was entry level, and so it was like a placement agency. There's always temps are, that are needed um, in studios when you know people are away or they don't have a headcount to add a new job, but they need the help. So this particular agency, and I would have to dig deep to find the name of them, but they specialize in placing at entertainment companies. So I did a whole battery of tests to show what skills I had on, um, on Microsoft Office. And they had a placement at the Jim Henson company because my background up to that point, my the work that I did, to make money while I was going to school was working at a human resources agency. Um, and so they liked my background. So I worked in an HR department and I sorted, um, I sorted resumes, which at the Jim Henson company is amazing. All the people who want to be creative and puppeteers, like it was kind of a, a just a joy to open up all of those resumes and sort through them. Um, but it was a very ad admin job and my boss was terrific. She and I hit it off well. And, um, you know, I, she, she asked me what I wanted to do. And I said, I really would like to get into marketing. And she said, okay, I'll take that into account. And but she liked my HR background and she gave me challenging projects to do. So, I mean, I guess my advice there is that, you know, you get in, you do the job you have and you do it well, because it's all about who you're going to meet. And that person is going to get you to the next place more often than not. And so, you know, I made good connections within that company. 
And like I said, she knew a lot of people. She was in HR. She knew a lot of people. And so knowing her, she got me to my next job because her, the boss I had after that was a good friend of her. Somebody that she worked at at Warner Brothers for many years previously. Um, and so every job that I've gotten since that job, getting into that agency has been through somebody I know. And interestingly, one piece of advice I always give, it's like, it's not your, it's not my friends even, you know, I have friends that I adore who would help me get a job if I needed it, but they don't always have a job. It's people that I've worked with who just enjoyed working with me or knew Laura gets it done. She's, she gets it done. There's not a lot of drama there. I recommend her. You need somebody I'm help. I'll help you find somebody. And so the other jobs I've gotten some after the new line thing, I floated for a bit before landing at Fox and, um, you know, like the president of my division had put me up for this consulting job and it was, it wasn't a great fit, but it was something that kept me busy in the interim. And, um, I met some really interesting people there who I ended up connecting with after the fact when I got into Fox, because it was an animation studio and we actually were working with that animation studio on something else. So you just constantly keep running into the same people over and over again. But the person who recommended me for the job at Disney, I'm sorry, at Fox, was somebody that I worked with at New Line. I didn't even know, like, we were in competition a little bit. So I had, would never expect him to be the one to recommend me. And he did. And we're friends to this day. He's like six offices down from me at Disney now. He went through the merger as well. So, you know, it's just, it's those types of things. The people that have reached out to me for other jobs since then, you know, it's a rare occasion that I will submit a resume for a job. When we're going through the merger, I, I absolutely, I'm not going to lie, I absolutely looked for other jobs because you never know what the outcome of a merger is going to be. And so it, it is a rare occasion when I just send a resume based on a posting online that I get even a call, even if my skills match perfectly. Um, it's always been somebody that you know who says, oh, I know that person. They kind of speak for you. I know them. They're great. You know, you should at least meet with them, even if they're not the right fit. Have, you know, get the meeting. And it's all about just getting the meeting and being able to speak for yourself about what you bring to a job. So, um, yeah, that was sort of my my thing was just been one thing to the next, but it's all been a lot of merger based activity, to be honest. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, Damien, you uh, you're in that freelance world, which is always a hustle. <laughs> you're always trying to find the next the next gig. And um, you, it, you started out as a PA, which feels like it's a pretty traditional pathway into freelance. But um, generally, you end up starting to specialize once you, you, you go down that path. So I'm curious to hear a little bit more from you about, you know, exactly how you moved from PA to, to um, you know, to where you are. What, what was it also uh, much like Laura, you know, through a series of relationships that you started to establish and um, how did those, how, how did you leverage those relationships over time to like continue to advance through, through freelancing? Yeah, it's, I think Laura gave some really good advice. It's about meeting people. It's about getting in the door any way you can, uh, working really hard and showing what you can do just as a worker. Um, so I worked a couple of summer jobs, like I said, as a, as a production assistant in the office. And some people, my supervisor who I was working with was like, you know, you know, she knew me pretty well. She was like, I think you'd be good at locations. I think you'd enjoy it and I think you, you'd be good at it. And I was introduced to the location manager on the job who I had known from just seeing in the office, but I didn't really have any kind of close relationship with him. And we talked for 10 minutes and um, kind of expressed my interest. And I learned a little bit more about what they really did. And, you know, I kept in touch and, and they kept in touch with me. And I got an opportunity not that long afterward, uh, just a, a few weeks to work with him uh, for a few weeks that summer before I went back to school and I, I learned how to scout and, and he taught me. And uh, I kept that connection, as I had mentioned before, throughout going to college and, and afterward. And that was the same person who two years later offered me a job on a show six weeks after I graduated school. So it's about working. It's about making connections. It's no one's going to get the perfect job that they want uh, on their first try, but get in the door work really hard, keep your eyes and 
ears open as to what other people on the crew, on the job may be doing. And I think that will help you understand what it's really like uh, at that position. And you'll learn a little bit more about what you might want to do or how you best fit in. Uh, and your opinions may even change from how you first entered the business to when you really see what it's like. Because I had different ideas of where I may fit in until I really saw what the work was like and I sort of changed my mind. And then it's about keeping those connections, working really hard and <clears throat> trying to take every opportunity that comes to you. And I think the, the way I always look at it, and I tell younger people that come in and work in offices that I'm a part of now, that it's about doing whatever task you have at hand to the best of your ability. And I find that the people that work hard, that you can tell just do everything they do, whether it's go get a cup of coffee or make a Xerox copy of something, if they do it attentively, and if they're asking smart questions, and if they're clearly working hard, those are the people that tend to get noticed. And the ones that are kind of doing their job half-assed are usually the ones that stay there much longer. So my recommendation would just be get in the door anywhere you can that you're interested in. Work as hard as you can. Keep your eyes and ears open to learn, make connections, and ask questions. And keep in touch with people that you may think uh, might have something to teach you or offer you in the future. And that's how you kind of start your network. Um, but bottom line is, wherever you start, whatever you do, just always remember to be working hard and to take every opportunity that comes your way, even if it may not be perfect in the beginning. Yeah, thanks for that, Damien. Um, Tom, I mean, you're, you're more in a position of hiring people, so I'm curious, you know, if one of these students were um, looking for uh, a position in a company like yours, what would be some advice you'd have for them of how to how to get into to a company like yours? Um, right. No. Um, <laughs> combination of what uh, Damien said, you know, do whatever freelance jobs you can get um, and give some experience. And, and uh, he laid it out pretty well. And uh, I work with some nice people talented and there's one expression I like the production guy says is if you're on time you're late and uh, do your <laughs> job and when you're, when you're done with that job and when you have time go ask to do some more go ask what can I do what can I help so those are the things that get you noticed like uh, Damien said um, if you can find an internship somewhere uh, that would be great do stuff on your own with friends uh, build a reel if that's what you want to have. Uh, but there are different types of positions out there. You know, I, I come up as a bean counter, and um, so, but I enjoy seeing what's going on uh, with the editors. We've got a lot of offline editors, online editors, music people, um, music rights licensing, soundstage stuff, uh, live action shoots, animation podcasts, there's all kinds of opportunities if you're not going to be on the screen um, to get into the industry. I happen to be in a, uh, a profession that's very portable. And so, uh, you know, I could be working someplace making widgets, but this is a lot more fun uh, <laughs> on the creative side. Of I also want to add something to what Damien said as well, because you know, working, doing the job you have and doing it really well, sometimes you think, I don't know why I'm doing this. This isn't what I want to do for the long run, but I will tell you, I could line list for you every job that I've had and how that experience has somehow so, somewhere down the road fed into something else that I'm doing and made me a stronger candidate. And I'm talking, or made me a better worker. I mean, from waiting tables, the amount of the way that you have to remember things, I developed a really good memory from waiting tables and that serves me well even today. I mean, I haven't waited tables in 20 years and I still call back on some of those tricks to remember things to get my job done because I have a lot of different parts moving and I have to keep them straight. Or um, I had this job, uh, I, I started, when I moved to New Jersey right after college, I, had, I worked at this music promotions company and that's where I decided I wasn't cut out for the music business, but I was on the retail side and I learned every single chain across the country that sells records. I met my husband that way too, just <laughs> I called him before, that's how we met. Um, but when I moved to Los Angeles and 
uh, home entertainment was starting to pick up. It was a big deal. Rental was starting to transfer into sell through business and they were selling to guess who every single store that I had to memorize for that first job that I had in New Jersey. And I was a shoe in for that job because I already knew what strawberries was and what FYE was and all of these places, what region of the country they were in, I knew. And so that really lent itself to me, even though in the moment of that job, I was like, oh, when am I ever gonna use this again? I'll promise you most of the skills that you have in one job in some way, shape or form, they will come up again later and you'll find that to be a selling point for why you should get the next job. So never dismiss the work you have to do, even if you don't enjoy it as not being useful in some way, shape or form. And to, to continue on with that, um, not only have the skills and do the job, but boy, it sure is helpful if you're nice. Be nice. <laughs> Life's too short. There's a lot of groups out there. I have a sticker on my uh, front door window of the studio, Bozo with the red slasher. No Bozos. I don't want to hire Bozos. I want to work with Bozos. I don't want to vendor Bozos. Um, be nuts. And if someone's, you know, be pleasant. And if someone's having a bit, you know, kind of screws up, they didn't wake up in the morning thinking, I'm going to go in and to screw up today. You know, uh, help them out. Help them solve a problem rather than jump on them. You know. Yeah. And I'll say Disney is what you'd expect. It Out of the three studios I've worked for, Disney's the nicest studio. People are very nice to each other. So it's, it's kind of a different, mm -hmm. you have to gear yourself up for that because after two decades of, and not that I didn't work at a place where people were nice, it was just a different culture and a different way of people getting things. Here is just a different tone. It's what you'd expect when you're surrounded by uh, the kind of properties that they push, the very family friendly and that sort of, a, um, you know, and they have the incentive and the perk to work here is free park tickets. People tend to be very <laughs> nice to each other. So it's it's a nice environment. It is it is different from working in an automotive manufacturing plant for a lot of years to go work for an entertainment business. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, two different yeah. cultures. Very much. That That's a good transition into um question that was was put forward which was just about what was one of um, the preconceived notions that you had when you entered the industry um, I'm wondering maybe Damien you want to start us off you know I'm not sure I had too many to be honest um, I, I got introduced to the industry when I was pretty young um, and I don't think I had uh, too much preconceived notion about it. Uh, you know, I would say this, a lot of people have the notion of the entertainment business, um, film and TV specifically, as glamorized. And it is at the, you know, Oscars, Emmy Awards <laughs> level. The work it takes to make those shows is extremely hard. And you will be, you, you'd be hard to find another industry where the people who are there making the product, think of any assembly line. I know we're talking about Michigan here, right? So think of your automotive lines, the factory workers. Film and TV is a factory. We just happen to make entertainment. But the workers that do that on the ground, on that sort of entertainment assembly line, so to speak, some of the hardest working people that you would find. And the hours that are put in and the time and effort and the care that's put in to create what ultimately becomes the end product movie or TV show is extreme. And I think most people don't realize how hard it is to work on a movie or TV show on a crew level. And I will tell you, it's very hard. It can be very rewarding. And you can, you can ultimately, without too much time working in the business and, and with some fortune, get paid well only two or three years after starting in the business, which is hard to find out there in most industries but you will put in the time and effort. And we're one of the only businesses where if you work a 12 hour day, that's about average mm. or expected. Most people out there in the, in the regular world in, in real jobs, as I like to tell them, as I like to call them, um, you work eight, maybe 10 hours, you go home, you don't really take your homework with you. Doesn't really exist in our business. So I think that's a notion that's out there that I think a lot of people have perceptions about our business uh, without working in it. 
uh, that can be a bit misleading and people find out really quick what it's really like to work on the ground. Yeah, and I, I uh, somebody, I can't take uh, credit for this quote, but somebody compared our industry as um, it's like being asked to run a marathon at a sprint pace. So it's it can be exhausting. Yeah, I mean, I started out actually in commercial film production and my longest day was like 18 hours. So I totally know sure. um, exactly what you're talking about. Um, yeah. Uh, Mark, do you have any um, pre preconceived notions that you, you entered into screenwriting I, with? It's interesting because yeah, I did you know get started relatively young as well, but I, I, I think that I kind of felt it was impenetrable in a way and that it was a hard thing to enter and that it was someone else that did this and it wasn't, you know, and um, and having internships and taking advantage of those early opportunities, even if I had to like have a, you know another side job just to kind of afford to be able to do that internship early on, it was essential to not only creating opportunity but demystifying the, and changing the notion of the fact that oh yeah this is these are real people just like me who are doing this and they're no more um or less qualified than i might be so uh, just getting exposure to it in whatever way you can is the best way to demystify it um and we have people now you know we hire young people um we um we do look for um people who are smart and always willing to say well is there anything else i can do is can i can i you know, any the person who says, you know, what else can I do instead of just doing the bare minimum, but stepping forward, that person will always advance and always have a job if they're nice, if they're, um, you know, if they've got a decent personality where you don't mind having them around. And if they, on top of that, say, what else can I do? That Those words will take you a very long way uh, in terms of getting um, hired and rehired for years. Yeah, and no, I... Um... I imagine, Mark, especially with uh, the um, with Big Mouth and human resources, that uh, <coughs> there's like a process to get into, let's say, the writer's room on a show like mm -hmm. that. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, we, you know, our writers, we have uh, um, a few different paths uh, that people follow to get into the writer's room. Um, and we have over the last few years started a mentee program actually in which we've had one or two mentees at a time which where we've kind of given them a eight week window to kind of be a visitor or during covid it a lot we had a zoom room so there was no limit on um the physical capacity of the room to include um, someone who might have their camera turned off and being able to observe how we work and next week we're going back in person so we're um, so we're trying to figure out how to keep this thing alive with this mentor this mentorship thing and to create the opportunity to give exposure to um, outsiders into the room uh, while still being back in a shared space. So we're going to see if we completely abandon the virtual component. If we haven't, then we might utilize that as an opportunity maker. Um, but a lot of the people in the room, they work their way up through being uh, at the entry level uh, position, which is uh, also where Damien started at the PA level, the production assistant. And we have a writer's PA and that writer's PA that might move up to become an assistant uh, or the writer's assistant, which is a coveted job, which is the person who's in the writer's room taking the notes on what all the writers are saying and keeping the script. Um, and that's um, a coveted job because it brings you very close to the writing process. And after exposure like that, you'll really get firsthand sense of like how scripts are made and how the process happens. And then um, people, you know, will be simultaneously working on their own stuff, but they'll also have a lot of connections that have been developed from within that room to get their stuff read and hopefully get their first job as a writer. So. Uh, uh, but the thing that I think um, everyone I know who's been successful has in common is perseverance, is understanding that it's the application of a lot of effort over a continuous period of time. 
Um, and if you're perseverant, that quality seems to be one that a lot of successful people, if not all the successful people I know have in common, uh, is that, uh, that idea of keep, keeping going and keeping focused and, um, and the, you know, and, and making opportunities, but the opportunities will come if you, if you work hard and, and, uh, keep saying, what else can I do? Yeah. I'm wondering, Laura, if, um, you know, how much perseverance is also a part of the marketing world in, in this business? Um, so much, I mean, you know, I, in the time that I, so let's use home entertainment. Uh, when I started in home entertainment, it was a rental business on VHS. And by the time I left the home entertainment business, we were switching to like our third level of high definition discs. So it was always pivoting to new technology, new delivery methods, rebranding something, which titles were the right ones to put out. Um, and then of course it's moved on to streaming. So now it's not even maybe a physical business. So perseverance is, is just being open to whatever might be next. And I, I'm going to combine that to the whole merger thing. I, I, in the time I worked um, at New Line, New Line uh, had just been, well, Warner Brothers had just been bought by Time Warner, who previously they had been bought by Turner, or they were part of Turner, forgive me. But during the time that I was there, it was about 10 years, they were also bought by AOL. And so there was a constant perseverance to me is like just you're doing the work and your head is down and you're doing the best you can. And there's all of these outside influences that have nothing to do with you and your abilities. And have, you have no say in the outcome of those situations. I have nothing to do with whether I'm gonna survive a merger or not. The one um, at Fox was much more traditional than the Disney thing, I never saw that coming. So that was a very long drawn out period. And that was a very difficult time, but it was like, okay, if I apply for a job, I'd apply at Disney. I certainly hope they keep me. And pitching yourself as somebody who they could keep. So the perseverance is really just about staying with it, doing your best work, even in the most difficult situations, putting yourself out there. And I think one thing that I learned, it should be it's, at 20th Century Fox, it should have been branded over the head, was like um, over the doorway was don't take things personally. And that was one place that I really learned that lesson is that, you know, a lot of times people are just trying to get through their own day, right? And nobody means anything personally by it. And so you just focus on the work, you focus on getting things done, you know, things are out of your control, things are going to happen. And you just have to learn to pivot, pivot and stay with it and figure out new ways to get this old things done. I just I find that um, I got to a point in my career where I was feeling like uh, it was when I was in home entertainment at Fox and I just I knew I wasn't being challenged anymore and I but I felt stuck and I couldn't answer that question. One thing I did was I signed up for improv classes at um, the Groundlings. I am not good at improv. It is not, like being a comedian or in that capacity <laughs> is not my future, but I knew I needed something to help me think on my feet. And I took that class. I took I ended up loving it. I wasn't good at it, but I loved it. <laughs> and I took three or four workshops. You didn't have to do that. Like you didn't have to audition at that point to be a real person that does improv for a living. And I took those workshops because I just needed to get back to a place where I could be nimble and I could, you know, be in a meeting and something could happen unexpected and I could jump, I could pivot to something else and be creative. So I think that, um, this is an industry that's always changing, whether it's the technology, whether it's, you know, I mean, from a writing standpoint, there are different types of shows, something pops and all of a sudden everybody wants this type of show or, oh, you know, you get, no, nobody's, nobody's watching this type of a show until they are, you know, I've worked in marketing and some of the challenges, you know, you're putting together these strategies and you're, you're looking at a film and it's a comedy with women in it. It's like nobody's watching women in comedies until one is successful. Then everybody <laughs> wants to watch women in comedy. So it's an industry that's always changing and there's a statistic to back up everything that happens. And so you just have to just keep plowing through. You just have to plow through and take new information and how am I gonna use this and make the best out of the situation that I'm in and make the best of this product. You know, it's like, 
people like Mark, they, you guys make products that you want to be successful. You want to see the light of day. Well, that's where my type of job comes in is to make everybody aware of this title, bring out the best in it and make people focus and watch it and tune in or go to the movies or whatever it is. So, um, but to do that, you just have to be open-minded, um, recognize that you aren't an, I am not an expert at everything. I have worked at movies that run the gamut of things I don't know anything about. And you have to take the time to say, I'm not an expert. I'm gonna find myself an expert. I'm gonna have them explain this to me. And how can I do my best for that project, not being the person that it's it's meant for? There are movies that aren't meant for me. When I worked at New Line, they did a terrific stream of horror movies. Oh my God, I do not like horror movies <laughs> at all. But you know what? Like they're not for me and that's okay. And as a marketer, I have to figure out who they're for and what mindset that I need to be in or who I need to talk to, to make me an expert enough to make those people want to see this movie. So yeah, there's, it's a constant need to, to be open-minded, ask for help, turn to people who are experts, help yourself become an expert quickly and just think on your feet. Yeah, thanks for that. I think some of your improv skills wore off enough that uh, <laughs> you got people laughing here in the audience. So um. I use my hands a lot after improv. <laughs> a lot of gesturing. <laughs> this might be a good time to open it up um, to some questions from the students and our audience here in the studio. Um, if anybody has any, and if not, I can continue on. Um, and we do have a, uh, a couple questions that were sent in advance from some students as well. But if any, I just thought I'd give you an opportunity if anybody had anything. Yeah, sure. Grab the mic. This is Sydney again, who uh, is with the Wolverine Media Network. Oh, hello. I was just wondering, like, in all of your respective aspects of your careers, how do you keep up with, like, how you talked about earlier, the trends of things suddenly becoming popular and suddenly not being popular or something somebody suddenly requesting something and somebody suddenly not wanting something how do you keep up with all of that in your respective rights I'm, i mean for me the it's very hard and you have to think for yourself about um and because this is at the creation stage you know a lot of times i would imagine laura that you have to you have to sell the product that is made so you don't necessarily get to generate that so you have to deal with you know ho hopefully it's something you can believe in you know for for us when we're thinking about projects to pitch or create or or do um we're not thinking so much about trends or sometimes people do think about that and trying to like jump on that but we're thinking about what we as an audience would want, what what I as an audience would want to see. And um, because there's a pretty good chance that if you are interested in it and you a, a, and, and excited about it, that that's a pretty good test case right there for whether or not this is uh, there's going to be an audience for it because you, you your own taste um, really reflect a much larger world out there. Um, and it's very hard to work on and create something. And I don't know, Sydney, what, what, what your goals are, what path you want to pursue, but as a storyteller, it's very hard for you to devote yourself to a story you don't believe in and a story you don't want to see. Um, so you have to, it has to pass that first litmus test of, is this something that I think I could devote hours of my day, weeks, months, years of my life to, and that's a high threshold, but th that then um after that yeah you can't ex you, you know you're gonna go on the whole world is gonna go on like these waves and you can't really control that too much you know sometimes we'd be working on a project and you'd read in the trades oh there's this other thing coming out it's so similar it's gonna somehow disrupt my project and it was just a one-line description of another thing and then you know when it finally came out i realized oh, that had nothing to do with my project really but i was somehow scared off of what I was working on because of that. And that was silly too. You gotta kind of have your own barometer and, and that, that to me is the, the most important thing. Um, the, the business moves so quickly and world opinion moves so quickly. You know, like the, someone the other day was saying like, oh, um, the, uh, 
uh, The Last of Us. It's very popular now, you know. Um, uh, maybe we should do an animation about it, the end of the world, something. And like, like, first of all, do you want to do that? Are you interested <laughs> in doing that? Because uh, I don't watch that stuff. That's not my genre. I'm not really that compelled by it. Um, and secondly, you know, it takes us a year and a half to to go from green light to a delivery of this thing. So whatever trend you think is happening at the moment is it, it probably will burge itself out by the time you're ready to come to the marketplace, too. So you got to have a kind of a deeper compass than that. Yeah, me on the uh, creative development side, you, you have to have tough skin and Mm -hmm. You're going to be told no a lot. <laughs> um, I've been told no more than asking girls out in high school. You just get told <laughs> no a lot. But persevere. Yeah. It is a rejection business, and like even the most successful people are probably getting, you know, nine, nine no's to, to everyone yes they get. Um, and and that's that's very successful you know um so you do have to be prepared for that and not take it personally and you understand that you, know, you got to maintain that the faith in yourself and 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 the desire to get better at what you're doing uh, you know and to learn and to, and to see what can i learn here and if you keep doing that you know then then there's a road for you if I may add, uh, address this from a technology standpoint, you know, the zeitgeist of what people are, are looking for out there in the world, technology side of things, there are conferences, NAB, the latest and greatest in HD, virtual production, uh, you know, plugging into that network to go to those things every year, um, you can keep abreast of what, what's going on in that world. Yeah, I mean, the technology is never changing part of the business as well. Cam you know, cinematographers are learning new cameras every year. And so that's, that's a helpful piece I, of advice. I noticed uh, on the creative side, the introduction of technology, you know, Mark, how many times do you rely on a cell phone ringing in your script? Uh, that didn't <laughs> happen in you. <laughs> sure, sure. Or, or, or a text exchange yeah. for yeah. turning the course of the story, you know. Um, but, you know, at the heart of it, too, you're trading in things that are just timeless human emotions, you know, the want to find, find, find love or to uh, not be alone tonight or to or, 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 or to make money or whatever those things are that are timeless in you. Um, uh, and so the stories can kind of roll with the technology, too. And, uh, um, but uh, Anyway, so I hope we uh, answer, answer your question a bit. Other question? Ethan. Question. Yeah, we'll pass you the mic. You want to introduce yourself to uh, Hello, uh, my name is Ethan Peisel, and um, I'm pursuing uh, journalism and screen studies. I mean, media screen studies. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, my hmm. question is, um, I, I love writing and, and that's my passion, world building and everything. But let's say like, um, I'm one, I get the nose, like I have, I have to pursue, this is my dream. I want to pursue this, but so many no's happen. Is it like time to like say goodbye to your pat? I mean, not your passion, but to that project and just move on to a new idea well that's very interesting you know um uh and i don't know where you are in your journey and there are some you know we've had i've had six films made in addition to television stuff and it's funny because um it, for each of those films um there are another two or three but you know twice or three times as many uh that didn't get made and the ones that didn't get made are the ones weirdly that i spent years on um and the ones that did get made are the ones i spent weeks on um, <laughs> because they were just good ideas that came quickly to me now it doesn't mean that 
some things that take a long time to gestate aren't gonna aren't, aren't gonna be worthwhile. They are, um, but you you, you know there. There's a time sometimes to set things aside, even when I refer to that year to think that we took that time off. A lot of it was to take a lot of things that I've been weighing, weighing on me and struggling with and set them aside so that I could make room for new ideas. Um, I feel that um, you will, as I say, get a lot of no's, you'll get rejection. I always uh, made a point. It was a very important thing, which was to whenever I sent anything out, this is back in the days when I actually put in an envelope, put a stamp on it. Um, but when I sent something out, I wouldn't do that until I was working on the next thing so that my self-worth wasn't tied up in the thing that I was sending out. Um, it, and I didn't put too much, an, over, an abundance of weight on that because um, I wanted to be able to indemnify and protect myself from the rejection that was going to come potentially uh, by having a new project that I was passionate about. And and even if I didn't get um, what I wanted out of that project I just sent out, I would know that this thing that I'm working on now is where the real action is. So it's important, I think, to have a lot of irons on the fire, a lot of different things going so that you're not just thinking it's just this one thing and my whole success is built on that. You're not building a, a single project. You're trying to build a career and trying to build. Um, so you so that takes a, a, um, a lot of work. The rejection is going to come. And maybe sometimes if you're just batting your head against it or people aren't getting it, you know, there's no shame in stepping back, letting that simmer on the stove for a while while you put another pot on it and let that one begin to, 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 to boil. So um i think you know it's a process there are some things i've been i have been wanting to do for a long time that i ha never got going and may may never get going um and then as i say there's some that you just come up with an idea and you're like oh my god that's great and it comes rather quickly so being open to a lot of different paths is key and and keep continue to write you know you're still in school there so i don't think uh <laughs> you know uh, throwing in the towel uh, is uh on the list uh, of, of alternatives at the moment you know um, but um, anyway, that's my that's my thought. Thank you. Uh, Ava up here. Um, hi, uh, my name is Ava, and I am a double major in professional writing and rhetoric, and journalism and screen studies. Um, and my question is just, what has been the most rewarding part of the industry for each of you, um, and your various different sides of seeing that industry? Maybe, Laura, um, you want to take that and you can go to Damien after that. Um, the most rewarding. Um, I think when you have a project be really successful and you know it's, um, it's a contribution that you made is what made that be so successful. So I've done, um, I think my, my most uh, important project I ever worked on for me was the Lord of the Rings home entertainment. It was a huge thing. It was a huge responsibility. I was coming up, but it changed everything. It changed the way that I worked. But one of the things I did in that project was I had a really big presentation at Comic-Con San Diego. And I, it was single most, um, the best day in my career because everything just went perfectly. All the stars aligned, everything went fantastic. And so um, I think anytime you can feel like you contributed to something and you were part of its success, it, there's no feeling like it. That's how you sort of gets you through to the next thing. And then you have another project and there's something else about it that really resonates with you and you get, you know, another win. Something else goes really perfectly and you're like, I did that. I'm, I'm responsible for the success of this project. Um, I think those are the things that make it most rewarding. Damien? I think working on a project that's successful is great, but um, I'll go a different way than what Laura said. And, and uh, some of my greatest uh, pride and, and joy from a project is actually the relationships that I, that I have with people that I work with on it and um, the work we do together. Because a lot of the work that I do on my level it, it, it'll affect what goes on the screen, but my work and how much I enjoy it and the team around me, and I think how well we do, 
we can do an amazing job. The product that we're working on may not be a great movie or show in the end, but we could do amazing work. And so I tell people that um, the pride to take is about the work that you do and the relationships that you make with the people who you go on this journey with on a particular project, because uh, we will be working together more than we will see our families and friends when we're working on jobs. So that, that's a lot of, I have a lot of pride in that. And I have a lot of pride in people that I worked with who worked for me as assistants. And as I came up in the business, they came up with me. And now they're, you know, running their own shows and they're full-fledged department heads. And I feel like I help mentor them and help mentor their careers a little bit. And I personally get a lot of pride in that. Um, so those things are, are what's important to me. And some of the best jobs I've worked on have not been good movies. <laughs> and some of the hardest, most difficult jobs to work on that I really maybe didn't enjoy, those have been the best movies to watch or the shows to watch. But the process of getting there wasn't necessarily the best one to be a part of all the time, even though we took a lot of pride in the end product. So I try to have people, especially people who work who aren't right at the camera, who aren't directly uh, seeing the effect of their work and how that translates to on the screen, to take pride in the work that they do, in the accomplishments that we have on our tasks at hand, and not get too tied up in what happens in the final product a year from now when it comes out in the movie theaters or on the TV screen. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's that's how I look at it from from my end of the business. And if all things can align together, where well, you have a great experience with a great team and the show you're working on turns out to be a great success that a lot of people enjoy, that's, uh, that's a total winner. Tom? I have to echo what Damien says. Um, I, it's like in basketball, I didn't care to take the shot. I, I got greater joy out of making the pass, the assist. And so in my role, it's more about building a team. And uh, I just have the most wonderful people. Again, no bozos. Uh, <laughs> my president, senior VP of uh, Post, senior VP of Sound, uh, they've been with me for 20 years. Uh, just wonderful people, and they help build the business. So I take a lot of joy in that. There's another project I, it, was, it might open your eyes to different careers. Um, I helped launch an original musical in Assisi, Italy, called Francesco Il Musico. After the uh, earthquake there, I had to help rebuild the theater. It was written by Vincenzo Cerami, who co wrote Life is Beautiful with. Roberto Benini, the sets were Dante Ferretti, the costumes were Gabriele Pascucci, the music was Benoit Jutras, Cirque du Soleil. That was an enjoyable experience to see uh, work with people internationally and people who are doing set design, um, choreography, composing. There's all different avenues uh, in this uh, entertainment industry for you to explore and see if it uh, strikes a chord with you. Mark, um, I, my my best experience. I, I mean, I echo a lot of the other panelists' uh, thoughts about um, building a team and 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 mentoring people. Um, uh, and we have many employees who've been with us for ten and twenty years, which is amazing. Um, however, um, in terms of the creative experiences, um, yeah, the quality of the finished product is not directly correlated to the quality experience in making that product, it seems, you know, um, uh, though this movie that we made called Little Manhattan, w which was a coming of age movie that almost no one saw, I have to be honest, uh, you know, it was very little seen film, but it was the best experience uh, because it was, we were able to do something that was very small, but very personal to us and very much everything we wanted it to be, which is a rare experience from a creative standpoint is to be able to get the artistic freedom and opportunity to do the thing that you want to do so it wasn't about the outcome because it didn't become a big uh um financial success but it was an extraordinarily successful creative experience and probably the one that jumps to mind as being one of my best uh no question about it big mouth has similarly been a great experience it's been a very good creative experience really we were blessed to be at netflix at a time when they were really um just starting out and giving a great deal of creative freedom to to the storytellers 
uh, so we could do all the stuff that you know you couldn't believe that people are allowed to do. Um, and uh, and that that's been coupled with a big audience, which has been very gratifying as well to actually know the impact that um, uh, is being made through our work on the audience. And it's funny because you know, having done it for thirty years, you don't always know, and especially in the age of streaming, you know, it's very ephemeral the idea of who you're actually reaching. Uh, however, you know, we have been uh, it has been very nice to know that. Um, even anecdotally, the people come up to us and say how important the show is and get some talking and thinking about things that they haven't been able to talk about uh, with their kids or their parents or their whatever. Um, and uh, just to know that we're having a positive impact in that way is also rewarding. Thank you for that. Um, I think we have one more student question. Hello, my name is Joshua. Um, I am studying media production here at Dearborn. Um, I also do a lot of uh, production work also as like freelance stuff whenever I can get my hands on too. But I found myself in a spot where I'm unable to get work um, as far as productions and uh, whether it be behind the scenes or in front of the camera is very uh, difficult. And I find it to be um, demotivating sometimes as I'm not able to find work. So I wanted to ask uh, what I can do for myself to stay in the mindset and stay in the game without actually having any productions available for me. It's probably a very Michigan uh, specific kind of question <laughs> since well, we lost the incentive, you know, incentive here, you know, so. Yeah, it's not, there's not the same amount of opportunity there <coughs> that, um, I, and I think Lord, you referred to it and I referred, I grew up in Michigan and, um, Lauren, I don't know where you grew up, but the but we were forced to kind of move to a point where there was more opportunity to really pursue it. The business is not centered in 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 Detroit, unfortunately. There are opportunities there. My friend who went to U of M Dearborn, uh, uh, he got a internship at WDIV in Detroit and was able to, you know, kind of begin to get a little exposure through that there, but sometimes you have to go where there is more opportunity and that's challenging and scary even but um it's a common story in our business that you know you end up choosing between new york or la at some point um and I, uh, even if it's just for a period of time while you kind of figure things out just to create that that sense of more opportunity for yourself because there are tons more productions going on here you also have, have had the bad fortune of the last three years being this COVID period that has um you know impacted the amount of production and opportunity that's been going on and hopefully we're going to be seeing more activity and more opportunity uh, that so that the next three years will look better than the last three years um but uh again i think i don't know those are things that occur to me uh often damien i don't know what you think uh, uh about this yeah no i think that's all accurate and uh i think that um you have to you have to keep sort of the faith uh and keep the hustle going that you'll find what you want to do and, and as mark said a lot of people um do have to to go to new york or go to la um, Atlanta, Chicago, places where there are bigger production hubs to find more opportunity. Yeah. Um, and if you if you're really dedicated to it, it may be something that you may have to choose to do just to get on the path that you want to. Um, because I think where where you are now, assuming you're in the, the Dearborn area, there's probably not a lot of opportunities. Um, maybe more local stuff that that you know we wouldn't be aware of, um, but. If you know what you want, if you really have a clear mind as to your goals of what you want to do five years from now, 10 years from now, you should think about what experience you might need to gain to get there. Just set little short term goals that will lead to a, to a bigger goal. And that very well may be that you have to sort of take the risk, you know, pack up and go somewhere else. I, I don't know. It really depends on what you want to do. But I, I would encourage you to uh, to not give up. Um, a lot of people I know, especially in the beginning, work other sort of temp or freelance type jobs outside of the business until they're able to get more of a foothold within the business. 
And if you're interested in more of the, the creative side, like writing or directing or cinematography, I would suggest not, not getting a job in the business and working at somewhere that you can work, you know, not production hours, but more regular job hours and take the extra time you may have to do as, as Mark was advised many years ago and just write or just shoot stuff or just direct your own thing to help build up a little bit of a creative resume for yourself that you can help send out to get opportunities in other areas. If, if I can piggyback on that thought, um, post-production, if, if you're kind of in a dead zone and don't have time to uh, or any work right now and you can't pick up and move just yet, um, what can you shoot on your phone? What can you edit, put together? Use Adobe Premiere, put a reel together. There, there are projects that you can do yourself to, to build your own reel from a post-production standpoint that could get attention somewhere down the road. And um, Laura, do you know people who've, who've started off in marketing and found themselves somehow in another part of the business? Oh, wow, that's a good question. Um, yeah, I've definitely had people who, yeah, actually, I have to think about the people that I know. I, I know people that um, uh, was a head of publicity and he left the job. He went on to write a book and that led to, I don't know, and he had some connections and now he produces films. He does a little bit of everything. He's writing, producing, some directing. Um, a very colorful, his career has taken a very colorful path. When I meet up with him, I have no idea what else he may be <laughs> dipping his toe into. So, um, you know, and it all really came down to like who he knew and just connecting with people and being open to those connections. Um, yeah, a lot of people have moved on from being in certain jobs, just even switching companies, you know, going into something more like into Apple or Amazon and finding like a different area of the business that they're interested in. I think it's by getting experience and getting um, doing what you have to do when you're not getting exactly what you want. <laughs> you know, you do those jobs to fill in the time. It could it could enlighten you to like a whole new um, like a career path or something that you enjoy even more than what you thought you wanted to do. I think that's that's one thing that um, is just as much as you could be laser focused on what you want to do is being honest with yourself that when you're doing that or you're doing other things like where am I really leaning you know what is it that's that's calling me um and even if you if you think that you don't want it like events came to me events kept coming to me I've been strategy my whole career and events somehow it just kept ending up in my job description I have no idea how whether it was <laughs> you know, by choice or not. And so now that's what I do all the time. So it's just something like there's the things that you go seeking and they're the things that find you. So I think that, you know, how you can fill your time with other things that are just more learning experiences. You just never know. Um, is there a film office in Detroit still? I mean, is that an opportunity? I don't know. I'm, I'm not very good at those types of things, but I didn't know if that's an opportunity to find work? It is a good question you ask, and I, I am so new to this. I literally moved here in August, so I'm brand new um, to the I, area. But. I'm sure there is. Um, I have a good handful of connections that, as far as like job opportunities I've run into, um, re they recently had like a production office panel similar to this in um, downtown Detroit, where I met a handful of people. I actually met someone from LA um, that is was based from Michigan that moved out to LA. Um, really great friends with them. Um, it's just, I think again, it's just a very harder um, opportunity or business here in Michigan than it is in LA, New York. It is, I mean, uh, friends I know who are doing well there, they're not, they're not necessarily telling narrative things they're making. Um, industrial films and 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 um marketing and um uh, you know explanatory things and things like that but th that's what i've seen being some of the opportunity there but uh yeah creating your own stuff is a great 
thing to do and you don't need anyone to give you permission to do that. And a lot of times, you know, the survival job in this business, especially if you're on the creative side and have creative ambitions, is not necessarily like the PA job, but it's the job that gives you the time to, to pursue your creative thought. So the PA job is a 12 hour a day job is, as uh, was indicated, that'd be a short day for the PA. And that'll really limit the ability of you to create your own stuff. So if you can get a waiting table job for six hours a day, and then you'll have more time to devote to the other job, that's actually has value to you as a creative person, uh, because you'll have the time to pursue your creativity as well. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I'd, I'd just like to um, thank uh, all of you for um, joining us today. It's been really great to hear um, from all four of you about your experiences um, in, in the business. I know uh, you all have very busy schedules, as you've talked about, and um, we really appreciate you giving us this time to, to share with our students um, and let them know um, about your pathways and uh, different um, areas of expertise and different ways that you know, they might engage in um, a creative field like um, film. Uh, so. Um, please, everyone, let's give uh, Mark, Laura, Damien, and Tom a round of applause and thank them for their time. <laughs> and we hope thank to um, stay in touch with all four of you, um, especially with the uh, journalism and media production program. I hope that um, we can uh, you know, find ways to get our students into your various areas of, um, of the business. Thank well, you. We appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, thank absolutely. you, everybody. Thank you so much. Pleasure meeting you all. Yeah. Pleasure to meet Good you, night. too. Bye-bye. Yeah, take care.